User groups with lots to say, interviews and more. No way. Sharing great ideas in the tech community. Fascinating conversations, a plethora of information. Find out for yourself today at ugtastic.com. All right, great. So, uh, my Hi, name Matt. <laughs> one second. <clears throat> this is going to be a fun one. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Hi, it's Mike with Ugtastic. I'm at SCNA 2013, and I'm sitting down with Chet Hendrickson and Ron Jeffries. Or, or did I say that in the right order, gentlemen? No, I, I don't know. No. Okay, uh, which one? Uh, so which we'll, we'll find out in a second. But uh, they give a talk about uh, the nature of software development, and uh, and uh, also we're on a panel yesterday about oh, what was the panel on software quality. Uh, so so thank you very much for for taking the time to sit down with me. Uh, um, I, I, I think Would you guys are the name of your company again, please? Uh, Ugtastic. Ugtastic. That's Ugtastic. interesting. I wouldn't have guessed that. No, no. A lot of people just say Ugtastic, which is fine as long as you say it. I don't really care. Um, I'm just happy that anybody's even thinking about it. Mm. Um, but it's a we, we do interviews with people who are doing interesting things in the software development community, and I think and you guys are known for this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you guys have known for one or two things that are interesting, um, and uh, certainly your talk on. Uh, on software here at the end of SCNA. Uh, one of the things I had to say I, I kind of got a kick out of was the, the, the simplicity of, of your images. Everybody else tries to make these really super fancy typography um, uh, slides, whereas to convey the information, it was, it was simple drawings that could be uh, clearly, clearly understood and, and were not very not very artistic. Not, or, uh, not really well, very good. Not very really not good. But it, it reminded me of, of Sarah Gray, who I just interviewed when she talked about uh, um, Harold and the, and the Purple Crayon, that you can use simple imagery metaphors to convey a lot of information without getting bogged down in, in noise. Is this something that well, you... Well, tell us a little bit more about your thoughts on metaphor. Uh, well, that... <laughs> that I, now I'm messed up. So... <laughs> Well, but uh, I just was curious, is, is this something that, that you've been using for a long time? It, it, actually, it actually is. Um, Ron bought a tablet, PC, mm-hmm. I don't know, eight or ten years ago, and, and we started doing talks with just him drawing. Mm-hmm. Mostly little graphs. And little little graphs. And and if you do like good, it'll go up, and if you do bad, it'll go down, that sort of deal. Yeah. About that, about that love. And so, it, uh, and eventually I bought one and didn't use it as much as, as Ron. Uh, and it sort of evolved until now we do stuff uh, on the iPad uh, <laughs> using a, a, a tool called Paper, which allows you to draw very well, simple things. That's, so so uh, uh, it's a very nice little product. Uh, I wish we have got some kind of kickback when we mentioned their name. Yeah, sure. But uh, you know, it's, it's a simple little drawing tool uh, that it works really well in this environment mm-hmm. because it's, there's not much to it. You pick a color, you draw. As opposed to all kinds of stuff that the standard drawing kind of that becomes well. Now I have to learn this tool, and it's yes. crazy, and, and it's confusing. Well, and you're, but but we are, as you see with the pictures, you're still left with the fact that I can't draw very well, <laughs> which is why the pictures are also simple, really. Um, but probably it's not. I would really probably draw them simply, even if I were like able to draw something that looked real, um, because the idea is to catch attention illuminate the idea, not have people stare at it the way they would stare at great art and not listen to us because the point is perhaps to listen to the words as well as to see the pictures. Um, so there, and our main purpose in giving a talk is to entertain ourselves. Mm-hmm. It's up to the audience to entertain themselves. And so we enjoy having these funny little pictures and saying funny little things about them. And uh, in, your, in the way you did your presentation, it was back and forth and back and forth that that's that I've not I, res, I don't think I've ever seen anybody ping pong a, a presentation quite like that. We've been giving presentations about this kind of subject. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have the, actually the poster for the first one we gave in 1998. So we've been doing this quite this a talk long, for not, not this talk, but talking oh, okay. together, giving presentations together, uh, you know, for 15 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we have developed a style which kind of works for us and. and it, Oddly enough, this is sort of how we work anyway. It turns out, for example, in uh, we were coming back from the Netherlands and they interview you on the way out of the country to see if you're a terrorist or something. And 
they asked Chet if we were traveling together, and we said yes, and so we came up. And they kept, would, the guy would ask us a question, and one of us would start the answer, and the other would finish the sentence. And he said, well, why are you here? And he said, well, we said we were there to teach a class. And he said, well, what are you? You're in business? You know, we're business partners. We're partners, we said. That's yeah. partners. We're partners, we said. A business, said, business partner. <laughs> and he said, what kind of partners are you? And we kind of tried to tell him we were business partners. And so we kept doing this ping pong back and forth yeah. while we were being interviewed. And at the end of the thing, he said, I think I know what kind of partner you are. <laughs> so apparently we're too good at it. So the, ne the next time we went to the Netherlands, we took our wives. And hoped to meet just, the same guy. Uh, right. In hopes of saying, look, we have beards. Uh, that, <laughs> so we, we haven't done it for a long time. We tend to finish each other's sentences. And um, it works for us, and we hope it works for the audience. Yeah, and, and it seemed to definitely be well received. And, you know, and, and just continuing on with the, the images, I just wonder if, uh, with some of the... In, in a lot of the talks that I've observed, people are obsessing over typography and, and creating these um, very, what they think are professional looking, where really what I think it is is the message is what defines a professional talk and a professional communication. Um, do, you, do you see going to other people's presentations where they have very elaborate uh, uh, fonts, colors? I, I think if, Here's an example if, of our typography, if you yeah. can see that. Uh, this it, title is intentionally left blank. Yeah. In, in my handwriting. Uh, so. Yes. You know, we, we, we intentionally don't do that. Uh, I suppose, you know, we, I, I would think, we probably think we're not very good at doing those things, but if we spend a little bit of time, we, I'm sure we could do as well as everyone else does. Well, it would we tried it. various tools. We did some stuff in Prezi years ago to right. discover that you know, when, you, when you do that, everyone throws up at the, sometime mm -hmm. during your presentation. Uh, not because of what we were saying, because of the tool. The tool. Uh, and so we most... Oh, the one that spins around. Spins around. Yeah, around yeah, yeah, it's really cool. Yes, yeah. you know. It's cool. Oh, so you get, you get, you get, it's like an e-ride at Disney World. Uh, and so we, we have gone to this style mostly because I believe, I believe, uh, that we've learned long ago that the movement and the words convey the story. Uh, we come out of the old XP small talk world where CRC was used. Mm -hmm. The card, uh, the, the uh, class responsibility collaboration mm -hmm. technique. And, and we were taught to do CRC by Ken Beck, who was one of its inventors. If you've ever learned it, have you ever done this technique? I, I, when I was going through yeah. Agile, I was learning. Uh, Ken doesn't write on the cards. Yeah. The cards are blank. Really? And he just moves them around and talks about them. <laughs> because the words don't matter. It's what you say and what's going on. And after a while, you know that this one, that's the employee over there. It doesn't say yeah. anything, but it's the employee, and that one is the department or whatever the relationship is. And so it's the motion that gets the, the information across. And so, so I think we kind of pick the, that up. To the point where, in the middle of the conversation, when it becomes clear that there should be another object, people will point to a blank space and say, this guy right here. Right. Because everybody's got it in their head, and it's clear that the guy that you're talking about should be in this hole where there isn't any, any object. Um, so you're, you're, trying to, you're trying to get an idea into, into people's heads, and the, the beautiful picture doesn't necessarily do that. If it's too good looking, people will, will just look at it and be all taken over. That's what and then people are talking about the slide. Well, the picture talking about the slide. Um, now, we, we did do a talk one time where the, the slide was all done with pictures of cats, with lol cats kinds of, <laughs> of titles on them. Um, that worked well too, but again, it was just a little title yeah. from which we spoke for a couple of minutes and then went to another mm -hmm. picture of a cat. Um, yeah, so it's we, a style, and we think it, we, you know, it seems to work for us, and uh, we hope nobody else steals it, I guess. We tend to do all things this way. If you were for some, you know, go off the deep end and hire us to come in and do some sort of training for you, and we might show up with a slide deck of 200 slides, but we wouldn't show any of them to you. Right. We would draw everything live and talk about it as we went right. along. So those are like your reference, more like your notes. Because people like to have something. Oh, that they can walk away with. Because they can walk away with, yeah. you know, and, and mostly we say stuff that's in them. Uh, but we do it live mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it's that that we think generates the knowledge. If you're just standing there talking about the slide, the people check out, 
But if you're there talking to them and you're using some tool to help you them visualize what it is you're saying, that works better. And the and the more that's done in the moment, we think that the better it is. Mm -hmm. And so, as you described it, you've been doing talks for over 15 years. Um, as far as is the the, the the landscape of conferences and, and, and big technical get-togethers to, to discuss um, our, our industry, uh, do you have any, anything that you've seen that's changed in, in particular, or that, that either for the better or for worse? Yeah, the, uh, the big conferences we're finding more and more boring, um, not because of the many beginners who always show up because there's always new people coming into the field and that's fine but because they have become so commercialized and so so many of the ideas are canned mm -hmm. you know you must do this and follow this rule and use this tool and uh, so many things like that that we find that the content is mostly not interesting to us right. and we think almost harmful to to many of the people who show up um, there's a uh, a huge number of people who are there from a big enterprise because they want to have a flag that says they're agile right. and uh, they don't have no intention or ability to do it or at least have no understanding and probably mm -hmm. no ability to do it. So we're trying to come to smaller conferences like this one mm -hmm. because there you can talk to people and they're interesting and they're more full of people who are really excited about doing stuff. Now I don't know whether I believe this or not but I have a feeling that those conferences are going to be mostly developer conferences. That it's going to be difficult to find a conference that isn't heavy in the developers that we find exciting. I believe that's probably true because we are at on the heart in our hearts we're programmers. Mm -hmm. uh, we do the other stuff because that's where the money is. That's where the money is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wait, should, did I say that? Uh, uh, only developers. Only, but but. This is what we care about. You know, we, we come out of the XP world. It's, we're there to make the world safe for programmers. Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out in order to make the world safe for programmers, you have to do a lot of stuff in those other areas, talking with the business people and educating them about stuff. But in our hearts, we're here trying to make the world safe for programmers. Mm -hmm. And that just reminds me of a, of a, of a talk that Corey Haynes came uh, a few years ago to a TVA and was talking about how developers need to take responsibility for a lot of these these needs and the kind of are, are these craftsmanship concepts uh, that, that we're espousing. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of kicked back saying, well, we can, we're all of us here in this room, we are all agree that we would like to do all these things and that they're good practices, but the person with the, the purse strings is, is the business. And we can talk all day about how great it would be to do TDD and, and do it, but really you gotta sell. And that sounds like what you, well, think, the, the, the answer to that problem is something that Jim Highsmith said 10 or 12 years ago it, when asked, you know, how do I tell my managers, how do I get permission to do mm -hmm. this pair programming, to do this TDD, to do whatever the, the practice was. And Jim said, don't tell them. Right. They don't know what you're doing now anyway. Right. Do the right thing. And they'll see better results. They may ask you how you got that. And you make up whatever answer is appropriate. Right. Uh, but you know, do you need to tell them what editor you're using now? Do you right. need to tell them how you, you know? Do, do they know how you're doing your work now? No, they don't. Well, I mean, as, as you know, some shops do though. Like you go into a Microsoft Microsoft developer shop and try to introduce Ruby. <laughs> it's not going to happen. That's another. That's that a big question. That's a whole other question. That's a big question. Um, you, you know, the question of how do you get programmers to work the way programmers do ought to. If they're saying we have to ask management for permission to program, that's where the problem is. Because you don't have to ask management for permission to program. You might have to ask management for permission to use closure. Right. You should. Um, but the, to do your craft, no one has the right to, to tell you you can't do your craft. So there's some kind of fear thing, and I think, I think particularly younger programmers who haven't gotten to the point of being jaded to the point of saying, I'm just going to do this stuff and the rest of you can walk off, um, feel like they're supposed to be told what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, because when you were working at McDonald's, they told you what to do. Um, that ain't it. This is professional. This is, I am the guy who does this. You don't tell your surgeon how to cut, and you don't tell your programmer how to program. So, but people have to learn that. They have to learn that it is their job to know how to do this thing well. And that's, you know, what this movement is about, is to 
is to get people to know what it is and to know how to do it. Yeah. And, you know, and speaking of experience and getting to a certain point in your career, um, you know, I, I've, I've had my wife say, what are you going to do when you're after over 50? Are you still going to be a programmer? And I, I'm not mistaken, I believe you gentlemen might be approaching 50 or so. And, um, and, and yes. Yes, and I see that. From above, in my case. For, yeah, <laughs> and, 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 and mine as well. I'm, it's in the rearview mirror. Um, but I, I, as I walked up to your, to your table to invite you to come for an interview, you were working on code right there at the desk. And so obviously you're still very active in the developer community. For people who are looking down the road um, at whether or not there's a career in development past 30, um, I'm well past 30 myself, but you know, looking into the 40s and 50s and beyond, do you, what do you have? A, you obviously might have some insight. Into well, I, that. I would not care to work for a living. Mm -hmm. um, this is good because no one would hire me, mm -hmm. because I'm not the sort of person that works well with people telling me what to do. Um, I imagine I could have programmed as long as I wanted to, mm -hmm. but what happens is that your eyes get bigger. Mm -hmm. You, at some stage early on in your career, you realize you can't program it all by yourself, and so you have to program with a couple of other people. And that t means you have to learn to talk to them, you know, mm -hmm. maybe even look them in the eye once in a while. You have to fake that. <laughs> um, and as you grow, you don't just continue to grow to, to say, I really want to be even better at Emacs. You grow to want more things. Mm -hmm. And those things might be bigger products, they might be that you find joy in bringing up younger people. Mm -hmm. And so instead of just being a, the senior programmer on the team, maybe you begin to become a mentor. Maybe you become a mentor over many teams. So there's a whole spectrum of world out there. Um, I think it would be silly to imagine at age 25 that you have any clue at all what you'd like to be doing at mm -hmm. age 35. Something is going to appear in front of you and you're going to be like, oh, that's cool. <coughs> Go and get that squirrel. Right. Uh, and so I, I don't think you have to worry about that. Yeah. Um, if you're good at what you do, stuff will happen to you. They will promote you. Mm -hmm. They will say, he keeps getting things done. Now, all the teams that have him on him get things done. We should make him into a manager. We should make him into, you know, who knows what. And you got to be a little careful because you might not choose to go there, but right. you might. You know, if you could manage teams the way an agile guy would manage them, mm -hmm. that could be kind of a cool job. And it sounds like kind of what you're saying though in the management, uh, it doesn't have to be management in the way of being a middle manager, but it can be different. Like as you described, mentoring or working with other people in a different yeah. capacity, yeah. you could still might have the work well, manager. I, in the I wonder whether conventional hierarchic management is going to be around. In big companies, it will be, but because it takes a long time for those things to die. But if you look at what really gets hot, new, wonderful products done, mm -hmm. it's a bunch of people coming together, and then they get funding, and then they find somebody to sell it, and they do all these things. Mm -hmm. um, it's a much more interactive, much less conventional command and control management that happens. And so I think the opportunities are, are both more human mm -hmm. and less like administration and stuff like that. I, I've lived my life essentially seeking local maxima. Mm -hmm. I've done what appeared to make me happy within my short range of view. Uh, and oddly enough, that seems to have worked out really well. Is that your cookie? That is not my cookie. Would you like it? Uh, you're, you're welcome. I was, I was just local next Monday. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, the world is too complex a place to make any long-term plans as far as I can figure out. Uh, you know, I do what makes me happy every day. And when what I'm doing stops making me happy, I try to look around and see where where within 10 feet will, will I be happier? Well, and it's a, that's a tricky one because all of us who are technical know that local optimization could leave you in a bad place. Mm -hmm. You know, where there was really great stuff over here and all you did was become vice president of Microsoft. Um, well, okay. The world isn't quite like that. The world isn't a single optimization process. You Something bad happened there? No, it's um, going away though. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the world is multidimensional, and so it might really be that the, that the next thing that happens to you 
is that you hear about an interesting conference to go to, and you go to this interesting conference, and you run into some interesting people, and they say, what are you doing? They say, I'm working on a sucky job back in Detroit, and they say, well, you know, we really ought to think about what we're doing. They say, what are you doing? And we're building this spaceship. And you, you all of a sudden, boom, you bounce into an entirely different dimension. Right. So it isn't, it is local optimization. You know, I think it was just, I just cruise around going wherever the little krill are tastiest and munch them up. Yeah. But, you know, every now and again, something happens, it bounces you to a new dimension, and you just do stuff. So, and, and at conferences, going smaller, going to that local, yeah. uh, do you ever go to user groups? Do you have a history of going to user groups or participating? We don't hang with them. We go and talk with, you know, give a talk at them. Mm -hmm. But we mostly don't go and hang out at, at user groups. There are a couple local to us, and they always seem to meet at some time when I'm involved in doing something else. Right. You know, they, and it's mostly just bad luck. Uh, we're going to go give a talk. We're actually going to go show up and do something. I don't know exactly what it is. In January at, at one of the local groups in Ann Arbor. Uh, but mostly we, we've stopped the local for, reason, for some reason we don't go to those. One of the things we're I don't... We're mostly lazy, I think. Well, there's that. But I, one of the things I don't like about it, and I noticed this at the open spaces that we went to at, at Dave Hussman's Dev Jam that was last month here. Um, if we go to an open space, we have a tendency to take it over. Mm -hmm. Because we have so much to say about it, we can't stop. We right. can't stop ourselves. We know the answers. Um, and, or we think we do. And, and, and we're not really very good at coaching answers out of other people. That's mm -hmm. just kind of not our deal. And so at a user group, we always wind up being more of a focus than we would like to be. It, we, it's fun to go and hear an interesting talk. Right. But if it's a user group of people just talking, it doesn't work for us. We don't, you know, if, if that's going to happen, we would just assume they came to our office at the coffee shop and talked to us about their problems to hear what we had to say about it. So for some reason, that particular thing doesn't work for us. But I think it's because we're, I don't mean to say we're above all others, but we're at a different place in our work. And the user groups want to be kind of homogeneous. They want to all be kind of the people who are right now trying to fight their way up the uh, to get the company to do something, or the people who are all right now being entrepreneurial, or all whatever. And we're off in this other dimension that kind of doesn't fit with them. Well, do you, and do you find that maybe sometimes when you're trying to have a conversation, people, because of your reputations, might be more prone to just deferring? Well, you of... like that part. <laughs> um, I suppose, I suppose... But I mean, I'm sure it must get old, you know, when you're like, come on, challenge me. Well, we're not going to do that. We might, they might, we might lose. Uh, the, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I suppose that happens, particularly since at least one of us has a reputation of being really nasty and tough. Um, we're both really teddy bears, but there might be a little bit of that. Yeah. Um, and another, one of us was also raised by Jesuits and therefore can argue any subject on either side, and so it's really not a good idea. Yes. To challenge us, unless anybody you really ask a challenging, you've got to ask a challenging question that's really challenging. Right. You know, don't come in again and say, "What should I do?" You know, refactoring doesn't work because I don't know how to do it. It's like, yeah, it doesn't work because you don't know how to do it. Because we know that answer. We we've seen so many people learn how to do these things that this conference is all about, and seen they always benefit. Mm -hmm. And I heard somebody in the lunch line yesterday saying, "We tried TDD and it just doesn't work for our kind of software." It's like, no, see, there isn't any kind of software where you can't do that mm -hmm. if you're willing to invest into learning how to do it. There's somewhere it's very difficult. I seem to have to be inventing TDD for the programming thing you caught us programming with. But if you want to do it, you can do it, and it will, it will give you some benefit. It isn't possible. So we will tend, not, that kind of challenge doesn't mm -hmm. work very well because we know every argument. We've been doing this for 15 years, and, yeah. and so we just crushed the poor devil. And, and it, now it's cruel, and we don't like to be cruel. Even today, Jeff I, does, but I don't like to be cruel. Even today, I, I did an interview with uh, uh, another gentleman, Amitai Schleyer, who uh, is on the NetBSD Foundation, and he talked about how they even have a kernel called AnyKernel, which allows them to do testing against a mock kernel, so that they even can test unit tests uh, and, and do even security tests against this kind of mock kernel for NetBSD. And if you can unit test the kernel for an operating system, test you can you, test you, anything. Yeah, you can test anything. So that kind of just throws that argument right out. Uh, but again, I think maybe that's just 
people who just don't know. And that is really the deal. Um, so much, uh, so much of my resistance to doing some new thing mm -hmm. is that I don't know, and I don't like not knowing. I don't like going back to the beginning. Who was it who talked uh, yesterday about uh, going into a new language and you sort of have to start all over? And, you can, know, I think. You know, can, and you, just, you don't, you sort of have to start all over, and I don't like that feeling of, of, mm -hmm. of discomfort. I have the luxury that I've programmed in so many languages that I know it's in there to be found. Right. And so I'm a little bit more comfortable. But as Chet knows, if it comes down to, okay, now you gotta install all that crap on your Mac so that you can actually run Ruby and you gotta you know, be able to load up every version of Ruby and Ruby Env and all, the, you know, all those little stacks, I know that when I go to the internet and say, how do you install that? It will have perfectly clear instructions and I will do exactly those instructions and it won't work. Yeah. And it is really irritating. Mm -hmm. And so I resist doing some things like that because I don't know how to do it. I think that's always what happens. I think we, people resist refactoring because they don't know how to do it. So it doesn't work very well. Well, it's because you're not very good at it yet. Nobody likes to be told you're doing it wrong, but the fact remains when we're not performing well, there's something we're, not, we're doing wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that you just have to accept that. that it, it isn't the world. The computer didn't break your program. Right. I know who broke the program that was broken when you came up to us. Mm -hmm. I did. And, and there's no doubt in my mind that it isn't that my iPad is broken, or that suddenly Codia doesn't work, or that the language Lua doesn't include if statements. I know I broke this. Right. Uh, and that's, that's part of what we got to do. Well, thank you very much for taking the time. I know it's we're a pleasure. Close. I hope you're going to edit this down to about two minutes. Uh, no. Oh. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. All right. User groups with lots to say, interviews and more. No way. Sharing great ideas in the tech community. Fascinating conversations, a plethora of information. Find out for yourself today at ugtastic.com.